Welcome to Fire Engineering Training Minutes. I'm Mike McAvoy. Today I want to talk about spinal motion restriction. November 2018, three groups got together and published a position paper on spinal motion restriction. And notice I'm calling it spinal motion restriction because our current equipment and techniques do not actually provide spinal immobilization. So that term is gone. We're talking now about spinal motion restriction or the goal of limiting movement of the spine in a potentially spinal injured patient. The three groups that got together and published a position paper on this are the American College of Surgeons, Committee on Trauma, the National Association of EMS Physicians, and the American College of Emergency Physicians. Those three groups took many years to finally come to some consensus. So there are five indications now for spinal motion restriction. We're in a situation right here where it's a difficult to access location. We need to get this patient from where he fell at the bottom of a basement stair set to our stretcher upstairs by the ambulance. So the five indications for spinal motion restriction are an acutely altered level of consciousness, which is defined in the consensus paper as being somebody who's intoxicated or somebody with a Glasgow coma scale of less than 15, a GCS below 15. The second indication is midline neck or back tenderness. So on the midline of the back, having some tenderness or pain in the spine itself. The third indication is focal neurologic deficit. So somebody who has paresthesias or somebody who has inability to move some part of their lower extremities based on potentially based on a spinal cord injury. The fourth indication would be an anatomic deformity of the spine, which trauma folks would call some sort of step off. You look at the spine and you actually see some anatomic deformity of the spine itself. And then the fifth indication would be distracting injuries. So somebody who has something that potentially is causing them not to be able to appreciate that they have a neck or a back injury. So someone with an amputation or somebody with a significant injury that's not to the spine that distracts them. So those would be the five indications where we'd say spinal motion restriction is indicated for this patient. And spinal immobilization is not possible, but what we're going to do and what I'm going to talk about today is how we would actually move this patient, which prevents three things from occurring prevents lateral movement, prevents rotation, and prevents flexion of the spine itself. So we'll apply a cervical collar. The days of holding somebody's head until you could get a cervical collar are kind of beyond us. We're putting the collar on more as a reminder to the patient not to move their head. And you can verbally tell somebody don't move their head and keep them from flexing or extending their head prior to application of the collar. Collar is going to serve as a reminder to the person not to do that. Normally, in an injured spine, the muscles around the injury will help to control the movement of that area, and they'll tense up and cause the person to splint the spine themselves. And we want to take advantage of the natural mechanisms in the body that do that. So we'll apply a collar, an appropriately sized collar, to the patient. And then in this particular situation, we're going to use a scoop stretcher to actually pick the patient up. We'll pre-measure the scoop stretcher, and we're really using this device just to carry the person from a difficult to access place to our ambulance cot. And what we'll do first is we'll attach the bottom of the scoop stretcher together. And then we'll slowly bring that in so that we encompass the patient. And it may be necessary because of the way the scoop stretcher is built to actually lift the patient's shoulders or lift their hips so that you're not pinching them in the stretcher as you bring it together. We'll go the other way a little bit.
Now the stretcher is completely snapped together. We're gonna to use the straps kind of in a crisscross fashion to secure the patient onto the stretcher. We could certainly use a long board to do this. I think when you use a long board to accomplish that, you probably have a lot more movement trying to get the patient onto the board. So the scoop stretcher is really an ideal device to limit some of the flexion, rotation, and extension of the patient's spine in the process. The other thing to keep in mind about spinal motion restriction is in patients with penetrating trauma, it has absolutely no role whatsoever. So persons with penetrating trauma should be brought to a trauma center. Spinal motion restriction is wasting time with that population. So we will lift this up. We'll carry the patient out of the basement to get him to our stretcher, which is upstairs by the ambulance. Two, three. We're gonna place the scoop stretcher on top of our ambulance stretcher. We'll come up a little bit higher so that we get the head towards the top. And now we're gonna do the spinal motion restriction using the stretcher itself. So we'll take the scoop off of the patient. The scoop was merely to move somebody from a difficult to access location onto our stretcher. So we'll undo the straps. And then we're gonna take the scoop off by removing the split at the top of the stretcher first. And then we'll undo the bottom. And now the scoop is gonna come off in pieces. So we'll take one side off first. And then we'll remove the other side. And it's probably desirable to have the head of the stretcher up a bit. But keep this in mind, spinal motion restriction cannot be done in a sitting position. So the highest that you'd wanna go with the head of the stretcher is 30 degrees. We'll raise the head up a little bit here for comfort for the patient. And then we'll put the sheets on, use the straps on the stretcher to actually provide the spinal motion restriction to the patient. So we'll wrap them up. Get our bars on the stretcher up. Put the straps of the stretcher in place. We're definitely gonna use our shoulder straps because we're trying to prevent rotation and flexion and actually do some restriction of motion. So these shoulder straps are critical to having that task accomplished. Bring this under your arm. And these be tightened up before you start transport so that they're actually limiting the motion of the patient. For bariatric patients, you can use an extender on the scoop stretcher to make it wider. Thanks for watching Fire Engineering Training Minutes. I'm Mike McAvoy. Be smart out there.